answer, and that is really Jay Rosenthal, because one of the first things I got to do last year when I came to Columbia was together with Jack host uh, the Age Boom Academy, which is another legacy of Robert and Butler, and co-created by Jack and Robert. And um, so in that course, I was uh, actually also first meeting Christine and heard about this amazing work we have been doing. And so I'm very pleased, in a way, to speak to the future of aging today, because you are an important component of the future of aging. And uh, what Michael so wisely called the possibilities, which are so important in my work, it's the technical term, it's the plasticity of aging. I think you're creating these possibilities that uh, make of aging uh, will make it so rich. So let me tell you a little bit more detail. That should work. Right, great. So the title I chose was um, on purpose, The More Years, More Life, because this More Years, More Life is also the title of a collection of recommendations that the National Academy of Sciences in Germany has put together some years ago, and I was uh, lucky enough to be a co-chair of that team, and I recommend to you, if you have an interest, go to the web and just enter more years, more life, and it will lead you to the PDF and you can download it. I think it's a very interesting um, piece of writing that is, in general terms, it's not highly technical, and I think it's really covering the breadth of what we have to undergo and have to change in society if we want to become a society of longer lives. So I want to talk about the possibilities of aging, the plasticity of aging. So the basic tenet is that aging as we observe it in the year 2014 is only but a snapshot in time. And aging and old age can actually be quite different from what we have known and what we are currently knowing if only we decide to make it such. Well, that's a very bold statement. <laughs> I'm one of you bold. Okay, so how is this possible? It's possible because human development is not eternal. Forget what you've may have learned in school, that we only can be what biology tells us to do. That is the cost. Obviously, Biology is crucial. We are biological organisms, and the genetics that are built in each of our cells are an important component of how our development, how our aging unfolds. But it's only one component. Biology is nothing, nothing, literally, it, without context. And if we do not take great care about the social cultural context that we afford, that we create, societies, we are, we are not well advanced. And only within context, the genetic can unfold. And actually, there is now a new strand of work in molecular biology, which is called epigenetics of biology. And that tells us and tries to understand in which way context influences the unfolding of the genetic and to just give you a quick example, I mean, even, you know, identical twins develop differently based on these very idiosyncratic, very individual interaction that each of the identical twins has with the context. And that starts in the womb, depending on which side of the, uh, in the placenta, one of the eggs is implanted as compared to the other. So it's, it's, it's amazing. The complexity is mind boggling Context can either let information come out of our genome or it can actually prohibit it to come out. So that's why biology is only one component. Second component is context, but then thirdly, and this is what makes us a unique species on this planet, it's the ability to self-reflect, it is the ability to have attitudes to make decisions to gain agency. And so we are the current player in this game. So it's this trial of biology, context, and person that brings about the aging trajectory. Now, it's obvious as this is an interaction 
and there are multiple interactions going on as we move through life, out of these interactions comes amazing inter-individual differences. So the older we get, the more different we become from each other because of this fight. And this is exactly where the possibility lies. This is the possibility that might be spoken about and that we call plasticity. So the plasticity is the modifiability of change. We can change our change. So we can change our change. Now, to illustrate, I've just brought this very schematic figure. So you can just imagine any domain of functioning, be it cognition or personality or social relations, and you have a certain trajectory on average at a given historical time in a given population. And then around that average trajectory, you have like a confidence interval. You have a range of possibilities. And the ones above the average, we come to call positive plasticity. But unfortunately, it can also go below, and then that's the negative plasticity. So whenever we speak about pathology and sicknesses or trauma, when we fall below our usual way of being, then that's the negative plasticity. And this realm of possibilities of plasticity comes about or feeds upon the different resources that we have available as individuals. And every individual has a very unique constellation of resources. So they are of a physical nature. We bring different bodies, uh, different genome to the plate. They are of a cultural uh, nature because we have a different background. We went to different schools. We took different interests. And they are also psychological. It's our intelligence, our cognition. It's our personality. Out of these resources, we can create this realm of possibility. But you will see that I will not, I don't undertake the argument that it is enough to look to the individual. Yes, the individual is really important, but we are also dependent on the social context. So we are living together as communities, and not uh, by chance, but because we need it as a species. And so our societal context, our communities, our institutions have to change the paces. It cannot be done by individuals alone. So I'd like to make three quick arguments, empirical arguments, to, to underscore this theoretical tenet that there is a lot of plasticity and possibility when it comes to aging. The first point is chronological age is an outlet. This is what you all know. This is the depiction of the longevity revolution, as Robert M. Butler has called it in one of his famous books. Starting from 1840, when we have reliable uh, records of life uh, survival times across different cultures, and up into the year 2013. So let's take the last 100 years roughly. And we see that we have an increase of 30 years of average life expectancy around the planet. And depicted here are always the world champions in average life expectancy. And you can also see that over the last decade, it really has been Japan. That has been the world record holder of average life expectancy. And so it's 30 years that we gained, half of which were at the beginning of life, 50, but half of which were really added at the end. Now, I think it's fair to say that this just unprecedented increase in, in, in lifespan has brought us into an era of societies of longer lives, not aging societies. Because whether a society with an aging population is aging is up to the society. So I'd like to make, you know, I think terminology plays an important role. And I think when, when you say a society of longer lives, it's like, oh, what's that? What do we need to accommodate longer lives? What do we need to change? I think it makes a difference. OK. So obviously, this hasn't come about because the genome changed. Evolution has very different timescales. This came about as a cultural issue. It came about because of medical development, because of hygiene, 
because of changes in the labor market, because of educational development, and so forth, nutrition, and so forth. An endless number of pieces of our culture of civilization. Now, we are fortunate enough that these longer lives have increasingly become healthier lives as well. <coughs> so this is just as an example, it's a study from Denmark, where they could show that a 75-year-old man in Denmark in the late 80s, which is depicted on the left, had eight and a half years to live, half of which dependent years, half of which active years. And you move to the right, and then in 2005, another 75-year-old man, at that time, 75-year-old, had nine and a half years to live. However, now, two-thirds are still active years, and one-third become dependent years. So, we live longer, but a disproportionate amount of these added years uh, are actually active and independent years. So, it's fair to say that in the year 2014, health age is unequal chronological age. So, 70 year, 75 years of age meant something very different in 87 than in the year 2005. And Jim Bopel, in a very important article in Nature, he actually calculated it across different epidemiological studies and he made the argument that we can roughly say that nowadays the chronological age of 80 equates a health age of 70. So this is this 10 year difference that sometimes you find in the news but in the news out any time. People just, you know, the 60s and the 50s. <laughs> but there, there, there is real proof to that. However, be cautious. This is not an automatism. It's a major achievement. It can go the other way. I spoke about positive publicity. It can go back, it can be negative publicity. And we have some dangers on the horizon, which just mentioned obesity and the diabetes that comes in the wake and the multimorbidity that comes in the wake. And if more and more cohorts move into old age with that burden, that will change the and actually, I didn't mention it before, but in the trend of uh, longevity, the US recently has actually dropped out. We hope it will come back on track, uh, but right now it's quite um, a challenging situation. Now to, to bring it home to you in an uh, even more drastic manner, I've brought two pictures to you. So culture changes biology. It's against what you may have heard in, in your teaching. Culture changes biology. You see here, some of you may know it, it's uh, Albrecht Dürer's mother, the most famous mother in Germany, if you wish. And he sketched her, uh, if you have been quick, and I'm sure all the researchers are very quick. He sketched her in 1514 at the age of 63. So had I asked you, and nothing was written alongside, do you think this woman is? You may have said, well, 110, <laughs> <laughs> um, this, it, it shows you how life imprints itself. This woman had, I don't know, 15, 20 children, multiple sicknesses to endure, and a very hard labor every day. Great hardship. Malnourished once in a while, I'm sure. Now look at this woman, and it's not a joke. I really searched on the web until I found a 63-year-old in the year 2014. And, I mean, obviously, we have cosmetics. She didn't have cosmetics, I'm sure. And <laughs> there's a big hairstyle and fashion. But even look at the skin, look at everything. It's, there's a tremendous difference. So I think it's really important for us to embrace this fact that aging can be changed and culture and lifestyle and decisions change the way we age. Now, a second example is cognition. Cognitive decline is one of the parts of the negative age stereotype, and I think it's, it's a big anxiety for us. What's happening with our mind as we go? And so I brought for you some of the findings. So, <coughs> This is the first basic finding when it comes to cognitive aging. 
one component of cognitive aging, the mechanics of the mind, which have to do with the neurons and their the connectedness and the transmitting of information between the neurons and the brain. That's called the mechanics of the mind. They follow that trajectory. That's pretty intimidating. <laughs> so the pinnacle is around 25, and after that there is a steady decline. Pretty intimidating. That's what has been observed in longitudinal work and intersectional work around the world for the past few years. You may say, well, there's hope, isn't there? There are all these yellow dots. <laughs> we service, obviously, are always. <laughs> so if you go to 70 and you pick the highest yellow dot, you find yourself above the average level of the 25 year old. Wow, here we are. So, no, no reason to be scared. Well, unfortunately, this, this top yellow dot at 70 has a biography behind him or herself. And so, this person knows very well where he or she came from. This person is experiencing negative change. So, obviously, less, it could be less, it could be. Uh, more, more dampened and at a higher level, but you experience yourself a change in the cognitive function. Now the question that uh, research asked was, is it possible to change that curve for everyone, the trajectory? So let's look into that. There are three mechanisms that have been identified that give us reason to believe, yes, this is possible. The first one I talked about, because our health age has improved, this has implications for our brain age as well. So we say 10 years difference. Nowadays, as compared to the generation before, this means that the turning point of the curve has been shifted to the right. Rather than being around 25, it's now maybe around 30 or 35. Second mechanism, as long as we can measure intellectual functioning, and that goes back to the 1920s, 1930s of the last century, we have found that from generation to generation, the medium level, the average level in the population has increased. Due to expansion in educational efforts, to better nutrition in the beginning years, more protein-rich diets, which is important for the growth of the brain. And this generational improvement on a population level actually is quite tremendous. I brought you some data that illustrate that. So I explained this to you. So on the bottom, you don't have chronological age. On the bottom, you have birth cohort. So when were these people born? It's a longitudinal study, the Seattle Longitudinal Study. And these are four tests of the mechanics of the mind. You see the oldest cohort, they were born in 1890. At the age of 23, had um, an av average performance which was in the 40s. You move to the right and the, boys, the people born in 1940, at the very same chronological age, 23, had on average a performance in their 50s. So it's about one and a half standard deviation across 50 years of historical time. And this is primarily due, as I said before, to the expansion in the educational system and nutrition and uh, so forth. So again, I would like to argue, let's forget about chronological age. The same chronological age implies different cognitive ages at different historical Obviously, it's more difficult to measure cognitive age and chronological age. Chronological age is written on your driver's license and whatnot, so it's much easier. Now, in a very recent study, a colleague of mine and I did uh, ask the question if that is true, from generation to generation, we increase our cognitive levels on a population level. What does it mean given population aging? You know, we read in the newspaper oh my god, population is aging, so we become unproductive, the economy collapses, no one can afford it, dependency ratios go up and whatnot. Now, is that really true? 
It's only true if we assume that after age 60, at age 65, people become incompetent and contribute. Now what we did in the study is we used longitudinal data from the UK, they have very good longitudinal data, and we projected into the future, actually the year 2045, what happens to the UK in the year 2045, given the population aging that is ongoing in the UK, with regard to cognitive levels of performance. And the projections showed us the following. In three different tasks, we saw that the population average in cognitive functioning does not go down, it goes up. Even though the UK in the year 2042 will be older from water on average. But because of this improvement from generation to generation in average cognitive functioning, play, it plays out on the population level such that even though we are chronologically older as a society, we are cognitively younger. That is what that these three lines tell you. So if the generational trend continues, then this is what the outcome is. We can grow older, but nevertheless, we will be cognitively Now, so this was the second mechanism. Remember, we moved the curve to the right. The second mechanism moves the curve up, but just at a higher level, which is good because then we reach low levels later. And now the third mechanism actually deals with the slope of the curve. Can we evaluate the decline, the steepness of the decline? And that is really uh, the results of training work in cognitive psychology that has been done over decades by now. And I'm just bringing it down to the current state of knowledge that we have. And that is the following. We can influence our cognitive functioning at any time in the lifespan by physical exercise. So we know physical exercise is good for our body, for our well-being, but it is good for our brain. So we train our muscles, we train this muscle. If we stop training these muscles, it will have effects on this muscle. So this is a longitudinal study that we did in Bremen across 12 months. And this is depicting the speed of information processing in three groups. The, yellow, the green bar is the aerobic group, walking, Nordic walking, fast walking. The, the red bar is coordination, gymnastics. And the blue bar is relaxation. After six months already, we find a significant improvement in the speed of new information processing for the aerobic group. Now, the fascinating part of that research is what comes now. That when you look into the brains of the people, of the walkers, as compared to the relaxation group, we find that in prefrontal areas, which is around here, that show the most pronounced age-related decline in terms of number of connections, number of neurons, we see a reactivation. It's a little bit like rewinding the clock. It's amazing. No one had thought before that that was possible in an adult brain to reactivate. But through physical activity, you actually stimulate neurogenesis in the adult brain. You stimulate the forming of new connections between neurons. And the transmitting of information is uh, much, much easier because of the um, messenger um, uh, dopamine is a very important messenger for the brain and that is stimulated through physical activity. And so you, these are just the data for that. It's again the green line, it's the walking group. For higher levels of performance, remember they were speedier, they were quicker, they need less activation. And this is what a young brain is like. A young brain is highly efficient, it needs very little capacity to have high volume. The older we get, the more we need activation in our brain to maintain the same levels of functioning. But with this exercise, intervention, you can actually go back a little bit in time and reactivate these areas that have undergone negative changes. 
Okay, so I would argue with these three mechanisms, we move it over, we move it up, and we can ameliorate the slope a little bit. So it's up to us, it's up to society, it's up to our habits, whether we are able to do that. Now, you know, laboratory work is all fine, but I think we also need to think about real life, and that's what all of your work and your contributions are about, right? So what I've painted up here is what kind of cognitive training can we have as we move through life? And I think we can have a lot, or we can miss it. And I think the training we can have is all in our activity patterns. What are the activity patterns that we display every day? At first it is in a work, paid work context, and later it is an activity pattern of choosing. Some paid, some unpaid. And the major message there is you have to have a lot of variability. It has, there have to be lots of changes in your activity patterns in order to maintain your current that's why I've modified this very cherished saying, use it or lose it. It's good, it's better than nothing, but what's really necessary is challenge it or use it. Use it. So it is always a little bit different from what you've done in the past that will give you the more, the added advantage for your career. And I would say for your whole being. Now, let me give you some data that supports that argument. We have done a study in a factory in Germany. It, it's a car manufacturing company. I'm not mentioning the name. Um, <laughs> and um, actually, we said we don't want to study very privileged professions. It's pretty obvious that privileged people with a high level of education have professions that are highly complex with a lot of variability in what you have to do every day. But what happens with assembly line work? You know, assembly line workers for us is like the epitome of routine. Now, we went to that company and we were able for a period of 16 years, 16 years in the same company, some workers had more task changes on the assembly line than others. And we matched these two groups of workers on all sorts of incoming characteristics, like level of cognitive functioning, openness to new experiences, and things like that. And so the only difference between the different <coughs> group of workers was whether they had past changes or not, more or less. And what you see here is, on one outcome of cognitive uh, functioning, you can see that the workers with the fewer changes had lower levels of cognitive functioning in this task they had a lower number of correct trials as the colleagues who had many task changes. And they were sh quicker, the ones with the more correct answers were quicker than the one with the fewer changes and uh, the more incorrect trials. So there's first evidence to show, yes, it also makes a difference in everyday life. If we expose ourselves to changes in what we do versus uh, stick to what we know how to do it. And we looked into the brains again, you can probably guess by now, and we find that the brain structure of the workers who have more task changes across 16 years is different from the workers who have fewer changes. And that is in areas, the three areas are po uh, pointed out there, in areas that are crucial for learning and attention they have more brain matter, i.e. there are more neurons uh, and more connections between neurons uh, in these workers who have more changes across the years. So it's not only measurable in their behavior, their cognitive performance is also measured inside the head. Now we have an additional finding in that study and that is very, I think, relieving. And that is we were interested what happens if a worker had fewer changes? Maybe if that person had a very exciting and variable leisure time life, what happens? And this is what this data shows. 
Remember, the little changes is the dark blue, many changes on work, in work, is the light blue. But if the dark blue people had a very variable leisure time life, you see what's happening. You cannot distinguish the two groups in their reaction times or in their level of uh, cognitive performance to make it easier. So that's why I said the variability in leisure time activity can actually compensate. So it's not necessarily paid work. So, I mean, obviously we have to earn our living, but if you don't get the variability in your paid work, you can look for it in your leisure time and it also serves your brain. But you have to continuously expose yourself and there has to be a challenge in, in the type of leisure time. And this is the final piece of evidence I want to show you. This is the experience score, which is one of the seminal studies in this country, uh, started by, by Linda Fried and Mark Friedman way back. And they have also done this type of intervention um, evidence collection. And so they looked at the cognitive functioning after six months for the control group, the match controls as compared to the experience core. Here it's the red bar is the experience core people. And you see that they improve. They have higher improvement in their cognitive functioning. And they find, based on their experience core activity, and they find in the brain, but now it is interesting, they find that they have increased activity in a number of areas that are relevant for that type of cognitive task. Remember before, for the physical activity, you have decrease in brain activity. So what this finding tells you that the compensatory power of the brain has been improved through the experience for exposure <laughs> or activity. It is not the rejuvenation that you gain from the physical because of the physical mechanisms that are stimulated through the muscle growth uh, of, the of the walking or swimming or bicycling. But on the behavioral level, the outcome is as positive. But it's very interesting to see that in the brain, different things happen depending on what type of intervention you do. Final point, very quick. Not only can we influence our cognition, we can also, we co-create our personality as we live, as we do things or don't. And I will show you one piece of evidence. It concerns the openness to new experience, one of the dimensions of personality that are measured by psychologists since we can measure personality. The openness to new experience <coughs> shows in many longitudinal studies a decline starting in midlife. Starting in midlife, the openness to new experience seems to be going down. The question we ask, does that have to be that way? Is it a natural thing that, okay, well, at one point you've had it, you know, you've seen it all, you know it all, why more new things, right? That's so plausible, it's so intuitive. Maybe it's uh, plausible, but not the way it has to be. Let me show you. So we had the opportunity to observe people, volunteers actually, that uh, were members or participated in a government uh, program in Germany for volunteers. And they have developed a training program for volunteers to empower volunteers in their activities as volunteers because there was a lot of dropout, early dropout, after people started to volunteer and then encountered difficulties and then they dropped out and could never be retrieved. And so they developed that curriculum three times, three days, nine days in total, for volunteers. And we compared the volunteers who had that training, nine days training, with volunteers who were on the waiting list. So both, both were positively selected groups because we know that people who are active like reservists uh, are a positively selected group. But they are matched on that. Now, when you look at that, you see an openness to new experience that the trained volunteers 
had this linear increase across 15 months, whereas the waiting list volunteers were basically flat, nothing happened, it's not significant. So what we took from that study is that if we get training and if we get the competencies that are necessary for us to be successful in a new setting, we actually like it. We actually get quite hooked and we want more of it because we are a quite curious species. And I think that's part of our success, our curiosity, our inventiveness. But we need to be supported in that. And obviously, if I know what I do in one area and I know I'm successful, why would I venture into a new area where I'm un unsure whether I can be successful? So I'd rather stick to what I've been doing than venturing out and challenging myself. But if I get empowered, if I get support, then I may do it, and then I may actually find how exciting it is, and I want more of that. So I think I've given you some evidence that let's forget about chronological age. Let's measure our other ages, health age, cognitive age, personality age. Really important. And let's avoid thinking, if I know the chronological age, I know what that person can or cannot do. It's just wrong. We will be dead wrong in the most cases. And we've seen that cognition can be changed. It's not easy, and you have to be on it, and you have to continue to do it. And personality can be influenced as well. And I think the bottom line to take from it is regular engagement in challenge activities is the key. Moving out of the comfort zone is the key. It's an important contribution to aging well and in a satisfied manner. And actually, by being engaged and staying engaged, we also make contribution to our communities in those cases as reserves and reserves have shown over the last uh, uh, 10 years or more. Thank you very much. And Like 
then maybe think about it and say, well, why not go a little bit over and take a little bit of a different book this time and expose myself to something I did not intuitively go to, you know? Uh, so it's these kinds of small things. Or if you, if you go somewhere and you meet new people and you find yourself thinking, oh, do I really need to have a new acquaintance and tell all about my biography and, and sort of like, you know, catch yourself and say, well, maybe there's something interesting in meeting this new person or whatever. And so it's these little things. So they're tweaks, really, yes. in daily life. But, but you have to be really active. And so your inner guts would want to do something else. And you go against it. And you say, no, I do it. And I know it's effortful and it will take me some energy to do it. And so I'm, that's what I mean with the comfort zone. Uh, we have to feel the effort to to stimulate changes in our brains. Tony, you had a comment, Chris, and then David. Yeah. First of all, I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation, yeah. and I, I hope that you'll be able to share the PowerPoint. Uh, I wonder, I wonder if you could say a few things about the larger cultural context and socioeconomic context that we're in. And you know, there's the work of the epidemiologists that were at the spirit level, and the impact of growing inequality. Here we are in you know, a country where inequality hasn't been this way since 100 years ago. What are the implications of that big trend on aging in America? Did everyone hear that question? Okay. Yeah. It's actually a very important question, and I tried to allude to that in the beginning when I spoke about the healthy years. Well, this is not an automatism, and that it doesn't apply to everyone in the same way. And unfortunately, in the US, but also in other industrialized nations, we are currently entertaining a survival difference up to 10 years between social classes. And that implies different mobility levels, obviously, and different costs for the healthcare system as well. And so this has to be one of the main targets into the future that we reduce that gap. We have to reduce the knowledge gap, the lifestyle gap, have to bring um, this type of knowledge, as I shared it here, out there and uh, make it accessible and make people believe that they also have their own plasticity and possibilities. So I very much agree. It's so crucial. And the earlier we start, the easier this is done. So going into kindergarten and preschool and empowering disadvantaged youth is, is so crucial. It's really crucial. Thank you, Chris. I, actually, you sort of answered it. I, my question was in connection with, you know, are we certain, or do we, or, or is there still remaining a question about, you know, when some of these changes have occurred? So, uh, my question was going to be, how important is, you know, kindergarten in connection with this, these outcomes, or, or education, or poverty? And I was particularly interested in how, um, you know, any other overlaying socioeconomic conditions of a community might play into it. So, you know. Kinds of things in our society and certainly around the world, and how do those play into this and that one point through those changes? Well, I think the first thing to say is the possibilities of development, the plasticity of development, are with us as long as we live. Unless major pathology intervenes. This, for instance, the cognitive plasticity has been studied also in demented people and Alzheimer's, and there it is dramatically reduced. Amazingly, it's not completely gone. You wouldn't believe it. There is still a little bit there. It's amazing. So it tells you this is this is the enormous strength of our species. We have this realm of possibility, and it is there as long as we live. However, the investments we have to make to activate it become more and more and more. And so the earlier we we grab people, and the earlier we influence their lifestyles and their outlooks on life. Uh, the easier it's done. But the, I, I, I think if another very important contextual influence is, is the labor market, is, is the work settings. And as I told you about the assembly line workers, obviously we don't have to be concerned about the privileged professions. We have to be concerned about the 80% or 75% of the labor market that do a routine job all their life. 
And that's what this one chaotic slide was all about. We cannot change all of these jobs, obviously, because they are necessary. But we can change the sequence in which people are exposed to them. So even at their level of qualification, if someone takes interest in it, we can construct new work biographies that are more variable. Not always up in the hierarchy, but horizontal careers. So you switch between different types of routine tasks, and that already would be better than being exposed 40 years or 50 years to the same doing this. Yeah. Great. Well, one more question, and then we're going to have to move on, Devin. I was just going to ask about your your uh, perspective on these contrived exercises that are being promoted versus uh, kind of more meaningful activity that research and other uh, uh, organizations present. Well, you may have noticed that on purpose I didn't speak about numosity and other stuff like that. <laughs> because, um, it's actually quite scary because they are on their track to FDA now. They want to be Describable, and there's a big lobby behind that. So the research about this type of cognitive tweaking, if you want to say it that way, is such that you get better in the tasks that you train. There is no evidence, in contrast to the physical intervention, <coughs> that the brain changes in the sense of becoming reactivated, that more neurons are are grown and more connections are grown. There's none of that evidence. I'm sure if you are a convinced numosity follower and you enjoy watching your increasing levels, it does something good to you. I would always say we have, and that's why I turn to these more everyday activities, I think you have a much more comprehensive approach if you find yourself a meaningful activity pattern out there in the world, whatever it is, you know. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, of the highest, I don't know, general contribution to the community. It can also be just rewarding to yourself. It's a kind of leisure activity that, that engages your, your brain and the whole body and so forth. And then I would always say, it's much better to do that. And we are currently, I mean, there's more research starting on things like, for instance, um, dancing. Uh, because dancing is interesting. It brings together physical exercise component, rhythmicity, and synchronicity, and the memory. Because you have to remember the steps, you have to synchronize yourself with your partner, and follow the music. And so it's a quite complex thing. And without noticing, you're doing all these things and improving uh, your, your, your being and have a lot of fun, you know. And so I'm saying it's more, I think we need much more systematic research on these everyday activity patterns and what is their impact. And, and so I, I cannot see it be much of a contribution to the future of aging if we have these hundred thousands of baby boomers sitting in their in their rooms doing the you know. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>